Amen, amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, will you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Judges, Judges chapter 6. Uh, what an opportunity uh, that you've given me to be able to be with you all four times in the next couple of weeks. And so uh, we're going to go on a journey together. We're going to look at four scenes in the life of this biblical character, Gideon. And so let me set up uh, his life. We're going to have to go a little bit uh, fast this morning as we look at him, but... Uh, uh, what an opportunity that we have to identify this hero's life and to look at some of the struggles that he had and some of the struggles that we have and see if we can connect uh, together. Uh, I had the opportunity of preaching up north a couple of weeks ago uh, near Chicago, and uh, I spoke to the pastor just this last week about that experience. And I told him, I, he said, how'd it go? And I said, well, it went good, uh, but I, 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 I sense there's division in your church. Now, that's not something that you want to hear from the guest speaker. So he paused for a moment, and he wanted to know what he says. He says, what do you mean? And I said, well, I was sitting there on the front row, and I noticed that the guy that was leading the music, he had on a, uh, a purple polo that said Minnesota Vikings. And I said, I know some of you all praying for him. And so uh, I, said, I said, your associate pastor was sitting near me on the front row, and he had a red polo on that said Kansas City Chiefs, all right? And maybe some of y'all pray for him. But, uh, and, and I looked out, and I saw one of your deacons, and one of your deacons had a green polo on that said Green Bay Packers, all right? And, and he just had this look of, 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 of you know, kind of confusion on his face. He says, yes, the pastor says, I'm I'm trying to bring them all together to be cowboy fans. I don't know. <laughs> Some of you have entered into football season. I'm not in football season yet. I'm hanging on to baseball season because our team, we're, we're fighting and we're in a good position. Some of you are saying amen because you're Cardinal fans, all right? Uh, some of you are saying oh my because you're Cub fans. I don't know. Uh, but but uh, I looked to try to find what was the greatest football team ever. And I imagine that might find us in some kind of conversation at a later date as you stick up for your team. But really, uh, sports folks will gather together and they will point to the 1899 Sewanee Tigers football team. Now, Sewanee at that time was a Christian college. Right now, they're known as University of the South. If you're one of those that like to Google the pastor as he talks, all right? Uh, Sewanee was their name in 1899, and history tells us that they may well have been not only the greatest football team of all time, they may be the greatest team of all time. Because of the smallness of their team, about 13, 14 guys, all right? This is a football team, so most of them are on the field for offense and then for defense, but uh, what set them apart was in 1899, they went undefeated. And in a period of one week, this little small Christian college went down on train and went through a tour of the South and played the powerhouse teams of their day, and they had uh, some success. Let me just read through their, their week, all right? Plodding through on a, on a train, and no, on November the 9th, 1899, they played Texas University at Austin, all right? And they beat them, the small Christian college, they beat them 10 to nothing. On November the 10th, 1899, they went across the state to Texas A&M at Houston and played them and beat them 12 to nothing. The following day, they went over to Tulane in New Orleans and played them, and they beat them. 23 to nothing. This was the next day. <laughs> All right? The following, or they, they took a day off, and then on November the 13th, all right, they went over and played LSU at Baton Rouge and beat them 34 to nothing. The following day, they went over and see what kind of business they could do at Ole Miss in Memphis and played them and beat them 12 to nothing. They went all through that, and you see these guys up here, and you're wondering, what happens if one of these guys goes down? What happens if, if, if you know, if, if somebody gets hurt? And, and you look through that, and this morning, here's what I want you to look at. 
It's not our size. It's not sometimes even our talent. It's what we can do together in the passion that we can have within us. And we know as believers that that passion that we have within us is the Holy Spirit at work in our life and with God in our life. Not only does he define who we are, but praise the Lord. He defines what we can do and who we can become in him. Our story begins in Judges chapter 6 at the beginning, and let me get you all caught up because we're going to hit it in the middle of the story. But uh, as, as Judges 6 opens up, we are discovering that the people of God are doing evil in the, lo- in the eyes of the Lord. In fact, if you look down to your scriptures, you're going to see that there's a word there that says, again, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. It means that this was a, 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 a kind of a, a, a continued problem that they have. They'd serve God a while, then they didn't serve God. They'd serve God a while, then they didn't serve God. And so again, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And every time they did evil, what God did is he would raise up, in the book of Judges, a foreign power to come in and uh, take over his, 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 uh, his people. Because uh, he needed them back, and he would not hold back on anything to get them back in perfect uh, unity with himself. And so on this particular occasion, God raised up the Midianite army, and the Midianite army came in, and the Bible says, devastated the people. Now we understand from history that the Midianite army is probably one of the largest armies to amass the planet at this time. And they were the fastest because they used horses and chariots in their warfare. They could travel very quickly. They were almost undefendable for the people of Israel. All right, And they would come in and because they didn't want to guard their uh, country, they would just wipe it out. All right, They would burn down buildings, they'd kill people and and devastate crops and, and, and kill their animals so that their whole society couldn't sustain itself. They would weaken the people so much that they would just be uh, easy for them to uh, control. All right, well, the scripture says that this thing went on. All right, they'd come in and devastate the people and then they would leave. They'd come in and devastate the people and they would leave. The Bible says that it, this thing went on for seven whole years. And finally, After the seventh year, they cried out to the Lord. Can you imagine them putting up with all that devastation and all that death, all that period of time, and then finally, after seven years, crying out to God? And when they cried out to God, God sent a prophet to speak to them. And the prophet's message wasn't a lot of good news, all right? It was a whole lot of bad news. And basically what the prophet said, he said, look, he says, God brought you out of Egypt. God sustained you. God put the crops in the ground. God did this, God did this, God did this, God did this. And at the end of the prophet's message, he said, but you didn't listen to me. Let me pause. Are we family? (laughs) We've been there. (laughs) There's one person in my family and they're loud. Praise God. (laughs) That's all I need. All right. We've been there. Have we been there? Look at all the great things that God has done for us. My lands. And, and how many times we haven't listened to the Lord. Now, if God would have ended the story at that point, it would have been pretty hard. But what was needed to know is that even at that point, God was working. Now, the people didn't know at the time, but God was working. And we can hear about that in Judges chapter 6, beginning uh, with verse 11. So would you stand in honor of the reading of the Lord's word? Oh, how wonderful that Chris has worked this week to fit all of those songs, especially uh, our soloist, uh, into this passage to speak to us even before the word. Praise the Lord for that. Look at uh, verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength that you have. And save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? 
But Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And the Lord answered, because I'll be with you, and you will strike down all of the Midianites together. Would you pray with me? Oh, Father. There are Gideons in our, in our room today. Folks, when they look at their life, they look through the lens of what the world has placed upon them or what they place upon themselves, and they see themselves as worthless. God, help us today to rob them of that lie. Help us today, Heavenly Father, to be able to see ourselves and to see this church with the perspective that you see it, God. To realize our potential, to be filled with your power. God, let that happen this morning. And if there would be one today that does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I pray this morning that they would hear very clearly that it all starts in our relationship with Christ. And today they would come and give their life to Jesus. We thank you and praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Hey, if you have your bulletins today, you might want to find that and be able to find some place to write these things down or, or uh, right there in the margin of your, uh, of your Bible. Uh, be able to get those things out. I told you last time I was here, easiest uh, place in the whole church to find something to write with is where? Look on your aisle back and forth. Find the lady with the largest purse. You know, give her some kind of of motion, she'll send some, some stuff down there to you. She'll take care of you. She's got office supplies in there for your use. And so we don't need to put it in the pew. We come packing every Sunday. So we're all right, all right? That's great, all right? So uh, uh, find some place uh, to, to write these things down. I'm going to give you three things, okay? Three things that happen when we are in the presence of God. Three things that we realize when we are in the presence of God and how that can make a difference in how we're living this week, okay? Or as we go off into the future, even as a congregation, how, uh, uh, what can we do? Now we pick up the story and we understand that the story describes to us when uh, the Lord, the angel, is going to show up to talk to Gideon. Uh, we find Gideon in a very unique place. The scripture describes the setting that he is he's threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, I'm glad that it was described like that because none of us uh, are uh, that, you know, um, uh, familiar with Gideon's day, and so we would need a little bit of help. But even us realize that uh, if you name it, it's named for its purpose. And so if you thresh wheat, you probably ought to be doing that in a, in a, in a, on a threshing floor. And if you're going to press wine, you pin, tend to do that in a, in a wine press. Now he's mixing this up. And, and that should catch our attention in the story. It does catch our attention because we wonder, even before the, the uh, story begins, why is he doing this? And then it plainly says, because he is afraid of the Midianites. I want you to see in the next four Sundays that we'll be together that uh, there is a continuation of a theme in Gideon's life. And the continuation of the theme that's going to keep on going, even to the end, even into chapter 7, is that he fights with fear. He's scared to death. Now let's pause. I don't want to give uh, Gideon a hard time because he has seen some stuff. Probably there's not a family or household in Israel that not have, has not faced some kind of devastation because of what the Midianites have done for them, all right? He's hiding out on purpose. There's, the world has not seen anything like Midian to this time, okay? And so he's, he's scared to death. And when the Lord shows up to him, why I need you to see how much that uh, Gideon is afraid, it, because we're going to compare it to what the Lord is about to say to Gideon, all right? So we got that. He's afraid. He's scared to death, all right? He, he's, he's hiding out. And then the Lord shows up, and notice what the Lord says to Gideon in uh, verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said... Look at this quote. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, as I studied that and I looked at that, I'm thinking, isn't it strange that the angel knew something about Gideon that Gideon didn't know about Gideon? 
Now, I, I, I would like to have, and I don't know if it works like this, but I'd like to have question and answer session when we get to heaven, all right? And people say, well, you won't care about, I, well, on this side, I, I care. I'd like to have question and answer session about heaven, and this is going to be one of mine. What happened that the angel knows something about Gideon that Gideon doesn't know about Gideon? Could it have happened like this? Could the angel have been recruited by the Lord and said, hey, I want you to go down there. That guy's my man. He's going to lead Israel out of the hand of the Midianite. And I want you to go down there and prepare him and, get, and, and tell him and, 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 and move him on that journey. And can you imagine that the angel said, that guy? <laughs> Are you kidding me? You want that guy? <laughs> that guy's nobody. <laughs> that guy's a zero. You want that guy? And do you suppose... Uh, the Lord has in his ability to say to the angel, you know why you say that? Because you're looking at him in chapter 6. Let me give you a little bit of a fast forward, and let me give you a picture of what this guy is in chapter 7. Because in chapter 7, he's amazing. In chapter 6, not so much. Maybe that's why when he comes into the presence of this guy, he's afraid, he's threshing wheat in a wine press, the angel says, the Lord... Woo is with you, you mighty warrior. I want to pause for a moment, and I want to allow that to hit home. Because there's two things that that angel was saying to Gideon that you and I need to know, all right? First of all, he said that the Lord was with him. When he said that the Lord was with him, it can mean two things, all right? It can mean, one, number one, it, it, it could be led to mean that he is the Lord was with him in that presence right there physically. Uh, Gideon was in the presence of the Lord. The Lord was there. All right? It could mean that. And that's pretty great. Isn't it neat that even when our soloist was singing, she said, sometimes it takes a storm to calm the storm uh, within. Even in the midst of the hardest times in our life when the presence of God comes to us, his peace far surpasses anything that's happening around us. Praise the Lord for that. God's peace is in the midst of that storm. It could mean that the Lord is here physically. Number two, it could have meant also that, the, that Gideon was in the Lord's favor. That Gideon was in the very center of the will of God. That God was getting ready to bless his socks off in the midst of a very hard time. Now both of those, whichever camp you want to get in, all right, both of those are pretty good camps to stay because what Gideon was at, Gideon found out that he was in the presence of God and he was in the favor of God. Maybe you're here this morning and it's all falling apart for you. Maybe this morning you look back at the last couple of weeks in your life and you're thinking, my land, you are describing me to a T. All I see is storm, 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 storm. And let me pause and say, I am so glad you're here today, if that is you. Thank you for coming today. Because, man, that's what church ought to be. It ought to be a time that we can come together and just love on each other. And, 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 and I realize I don't know you and I don't know what you're going through. But, but people in your aisle do, all right? And they, maybe they've already come to you in the midst of this morning. It's neat to be able to be here in the presence of God. Because when we sing and we exalt the name of the Lord, we are reminded that we are in the presence of God. And He's bigger than the storms of our life. Second thing, it could well be that even that all is falling apart around us, that we could be in the very center of the will of God. Let's just pause with that. Isn't that great? And so maybe this morning our prayer doesn't need to be, Lord, get me out of this mess. It might be, Lord, get in the mess with me. <laughs> get in the very center of my mess. I need to see you. Here's the second part he said. He said, the Lord's with you. We could have gone home after that one. That's a great truth. But look at the next one. Mighty warrior. Mighty warrior means two things in the original language. Here's the first one. It means full of heroism. And, and that's, that's ironic because the guy that's full of heroism is threshing wheat in a wine press. And he's scared to death. And why is he scared to death? Because the angel knows something about him that Gideon doesn't even know. He thinks he's full of fear. But God says, I, this guy's full of heroism. Here's number two. 
The title can also mean great leader. Great leader. So we look at all that, I want you to see a great truth that maybe this could be the thing that you, you know, you can remember throughout, uh, throughout the week. The Lord doesn't see you for who you are as much as he sees what you can be. He sees your potential. The Lord doesn't see you for who you are. He sees you for what you can be. He sees your potential. And church, let me tell you, that that might be one of the greatest ministries that God could call us into. You want to drastically change the life of a teenager? Stop seeing them for who they are. See them for who they can be. You want to drastically change the future of our church? Stop seeing us in our weakness. <laughs> Start seeing us in how, in how we can be. Because Mount Vernon needs a great church. And I'm in one today. Praise the Lord. And he's got a call upon this church unlike uh, we've ever seen. We're getting ready to go into a time, I, I believe, of great growth in this church. We're going to look back and we're going to say, my lands. That's what we used to be. But here's what we are in Christ. See us for who we can be. I remember um, getting a phone call from, I believe it was the Walmart store. All right? It may not have been. But they were calling me because they were asking for a uh, reference from one of our teenagers. And so they called me and they said, it's, we're not allowed to ask you specific questions of our character. You not, can't tell me these things. But I'm going to give you some questions and I want you to rate this individual 1 to 10. He says, I got about five of them. And then I, I just, I'll just mention the question, you rate her 1 to uh, it's a 10. Well, it's odd because I haven't received a lot. I used to reference a lot, but I've never received a lot of those like that. So uh, they mentioned the teenager's name. They're getting ready to the questions. They asked the first question, and they said something about her. It says, rate her uh, 1 to 10. And I said, oh, man, I can't. She says, you can't because she can't be rated? I know. I said, no. I says, because the scale, the scale won't hold this, this gal. That's what I said. The scale won't hold her. She's an 11. So if you want to leave this conversation kind of with what I think about her, just write on your card, 11, and let's go on. She says, okay, you think she's 11. We'll go on, all right? And they asked me another question about this gal. Now, this is a really good gal. So uh, she, I said to her, I said, man, I got the same problem with that question as you had about the other one. You want me to rate her 1 to 10? Really, she's off the scale. So would you do me a favor, just like we did on the first question, would you go ahead and write down 11? And he's, all right, I got you on 11. And uh, we had to do this five times. And so uh, it got obnoxious for you after two. He had to go five times, all right? So we're on the fifth question. He says, I realize that probably we're just going through the motions here. But she read the last question. And he says, would you rate her, sir? One to ten. And I said, no, you know I can't. He says, oh, you can stop right there. I'm writing down eleven. All right, that was the end of our conversation. He was great with that was, even though I had to put him through that, I called that gal up. And I got to tell her that story. I said, look, he says, I got this call. You use me for reference. They called me. Here's some things. And I kind of wrote down what they said. And, 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 and I said to her, hey, look, every time he said zero to ten, I didn't say ten. I said eleven. I said eleven, eleven, eleven. And at the end of the conversation, I said, go be that person. And when you show up, you go be that person. Because we think that of you, would you go live that out? Because I, 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 we see that in you, would you go live that out? And every time that I saw her, that was kind of our thing for the next couple of years before she graduated. She'd look at me and, and I'd say, and she'd say, I know, Pastor. Eleven. Eleven. The Lord doesn't see us for who we are. He sees us for what we can be. Go number two. His presence reveals our purpose, but also, also, his presence, oh, excuse me, his presence reveals his perspective. His presence also reveals his uh, purpose. Uh, what was Gideon's reaction? So we have this great statement by the angel. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of, of, of valor or mighty warrior. And look what Gideon replies in the passage. He says, but sir, Gideon replies, 
if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. Can you imagine the boldness of this guy? The angel shows up and gives this great title to him. See, Gideon had the opportunity from that day on to change the title on his business card. Gideon, mighty man of valor or mighty warrior. But instead of seizing that moment, he comes right back to the Lord and says, wait a minute, you say the Lord's with us. I don't think the Lord is with us. Because if the Lord was with us, then all this stuff that we were going through, we wouldn't have to go through it. I've seen sickness. I've seen death. I've seen struggle, I've seen, I've seen pain, I've seen terror, and yet you say that the Lord is, uh, is the Lord is with us? He says, why has this happened? Where was God? Have we been abandoned? Notice what God's answer was. This is pretty important, because in the scripture, we see people asking God why and God answering in these big terms. And this is the only time that I believe that I've seen in the scripture where he ever answers the why question. I'll, I'll give you an example. Do you remember when um, uh, Job, at the end of Job's life, was, uh, or his circumstance went to God and kept saying, God, why was this? Why this? Why this? Why this? Remember what God said to Job? Who are you? Where were you when uh, I put the planets in place or put the, the, the waves into the, the ocean? Where were you? Who are you? How, how, how can you ask these things? My ways are bigger than your ways, he said in other places of the scripture. But look, in this particular time, he answers the question. So look down at the scripture and notice what he does in verse 14. To answer Gideon's why question, the Lord turned to him. Look at verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength that you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? And it is so much easier to point to the pain than it is to go do something about it. It is so much easier to sit in our pew and talk about all the ugly things that are happening in the world, it is much harder to stand up and say, God, use me to do something about that. Take me to places where the pain is so I can be you in that pain. Take me to the places where there's suffering so that I can help in that suffering. Take me to those places. God, use me to do something in the midst of all of that, he says to him. Go in the strength that you have. In the presence of God, he reveals his perspective. He reveals his purpose. And the third thing, he's, he reveals his power. God says, he says, hey, go in the strength that you have. And Gideon replies, but Lord, how can I? How can I? Because I'm the least in my family, and my family is the least. I am a zero of zeros. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He says, how can I, Lord? How can I? He says, because I will go with you. Let me ask you this question. What is the call that God has upon your life that he's asking you to do? And when that call comes to us in our life and we say things like, it is huge, it is, it is scary. Uh, I was blessed even as we heard this morning the offertory prayer when uh, we were challenged with this phrase, God is asking us to do some pretty big things and they can be scary. And I says, you bet. But often I have found that if it's not scary and there's no risk, it's not worth doing. And God, God wants us 
do, do things that are bigger than us. Things that would cause us to have to depend upon him in order to do it. I think that's where we need to be. Only by God's strength and only through the power of God can you and I do the things that God wants us to do. I remember as a church planter in the midst of our building process, um, because I was a 20-something-year-old kid that didn't know what he didn't know, I wasn't scared by that process. It would scare me to death today. <laughs> but I didn't know what I didn't know. And I remember in the midst of that situation, what God did in my life was he taught me some of the things of, of Gideon. Because uh, we went after a building project we couldn't afford to complete. And I remember uh, running out of money in the midst of that building project, and we didn't, have, uh, we didn't have paint on the walls, we didn't have siding on the building, we didn't have uh, lights in the ceiling. And um, I was scared to death. And I had this idea, guys, I was 20-some years old. I had this idea that they're going to come in and shut us all down. And, oh, they'll, they're, I don't know, they'll cart me to jail because I didn't, I started a project we couldn't do. And I know that's all irrational, but I was afraid. And I remember during that time staying up late at night and, and, and praying, God, do something, God, do something, God, do something. And he started doing stuff. One of those things was on a Wednesday night, and it was that particular time during our church life that um, our ladies met in the ladies' bathroom for Wednesday night because that's the only place that had flooring, all right? And so I know that's odd, but that's what they chose, all right? Uh, I, our, our teenagers met in the back around some drywall, and uh, I taught them, and I saw one of our contractors walking in that Wednesday evening and walking to the big hole in the back of our church where the baptistry would be one day. And uh, I remember him and his wife just kind of standing there at the stage looking at that wall and that, that hole. And I, I, I came in, I, I thought he was looking for something, so I left the students, I came in to him, I said, what's going on? He said, um, Pastor, the Lord's been talking to our heart, and uh, we've been blessed through this project, and so uh, what my wife and I want to do is we would like to donate to baptistry for this church. I said, praise the Lord! And then when they left, I said to the Lord, Lord, I don't need a baptistry, you know. We were baptizing in a horse trough at that point, all right. I said, I don't need baptistry. What I need is I, I need some paint. I need some siding. I need some lights. Uh, a couple weeks later, a family came to me and said, um, Pastor, God has laid on our heart to provide the sound system for our church. <laughs> I said, yeah, can I give you some? Are we family? Here, there was a lady that spoke against it at that time, and she said, we don't need a sound system. He hollers enough already. <laughs> no, we know that's not true. <laughs> so, <laughs> I remember saying to the Lord, I said to the people, praise the Lord. But I remember saying in the car on the way home, I said, ah, we don't need a sound system. We need paint in the wall. We need siding for the, the building. We need lights. We didn't have carpet, you know. Um, Got a call a couple weeks later from a mentor of mine, Jim Doom, worked at IBSA. He called me up and he said, um, Donna and I have decided that um, we're going to use some money that we had saved for a project that didn't happen. We would like to provide a steeple for your church. And I, got, I, I, knew, I knew him, so I got unglued with him. And I told him, I said, I don't need that. I said, I do not need a steeple. He says, you want to do something great? Buy me carpet. You want to do something great? How about siding? I said, because your steeple is going to look out of place on a building with no siding, all right? You know, and then you come in, and we won't have lights, but they'll say, oh, you've got a nice steeple, all right? I, I don't need any of that. I want to have those things. And he says, well, I'm not buying carpet. I'm not buying paint. I'm not buying siding. We're going to get a steeple. And I got off the phone, and I told my wife, I was, just, I was just unglued. And I just went off. And here's what my, I, when you meet my wife, you're going to see that I married the Holy Spirit, all right? Because that's what she's often been to me. And she said to me, she says, don't you see it? 
And I said, no. Don't you see it? And I said, what do I see? She says, don't you see that if God's going to give you stuff that you don't need, isn't that an indication that he's getting ready to give you stuff that you do? And he did. Praise God. There's so much need. How are we going to do it? We're going to do it because God's in us. Let me close with this, with this last picture. One of my favorite football stories came out of the 1954 Cotton Bowl. You can Google that. And you're going to find in the 1954 Cotton Bowl, I believe Alabama is playing, uh, I, you Google it, maybe Michigan. I don't know. I know it's Alabama. Um, and let's call it Michigan, and don't tell me I'm wrong, okay? All right? But uh, Dickie Mulger is the, quarter, is the running back for uh, Michigan at the time, and he has already scored three times in the Cotton Bowl. All right? He's already scored three times. And they're beating Alabama pretty bad. Alabama has scored once, and it's getting late in the game. And the uh, Alabama running back, who was dynamic the following year, his name's Tommy Lewis. And Tommy scored one time. Dickie Mulger scored three times. They're so into the game, they're, and they're getting ready to lose, that well, one of the most odd scenes in college football happens during this, this quarter. What happens is that Mulgar is the, t the Alabama has, has got Michigan way back in their own in, uh, own uh, yard, um, area. You, you finish. The, uh, um, he's broken through. He's broken through. Mulgar is broken through, and he's at one of those places. He's got like like ninety some yards of of unprotected ground. And he just starts to run. And you, just, you can see it. You've been there before. You can see it. He's running for a touchdown. He's, it's unstoppable. Nobody's around him. He's running, okay? This is when the odd play happens. Lewis is on the sideline of Alabama, okay? He gets so into what's about to happen and feels so emotional about this particular play, which really is the cement of the defeat of his team, that he does something illegal. He comes off of the bench. Okay, some of y'all saw that. He comes off of the bench, he gets onto the field, and he tackles Mulger before he reaches the end zone. Now, the story tells you that when he does this, he quickly goes back, all right? <laughs> all right? And, and, and they show him, look, he didn't know what he's doing. He's, he's crying. They protect him. He has to go to the coach at the end of the game and apologize. And, and, and Alabama is protecting the, him from the, the media. They won't let the media in the locker room. And he, he's devastated. He, 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 he knows he wasn't supposed to do it, but he did it. Because of great technology, you can Google that story and you can find you can find the Birmingham newspaper that came out the day after that particular game. And you will find on the front page in the middle section Tommy Lewis's quote of why he did that. And here's what he says. He says, I suppose I just got so full of Alabama that I couldn't stay still. I looked at that, I was like, how does that apply to us? Here's how that applies to us. We have 1.8 billion people in the world that have not heard the gospel of Jesus. That should bother us so much that we can't stand still. <laughs> there are thousands in Mount Vernon alone that have never experienced, not only have they never experienced a relationship with Christ, but they have never experienced what it means to be a part of a loving church family. They got up this morning and they're clueless that God has something like this over here at Logan Street. Isn't that a shame? That, that, ought to, uh, that should so fill us with passion that we can't be still. And, and it's not Alabama that we're full of. It's the Holy Spirit. He told Gideon. Gideon said, how can I do this? Where can I go? How can I do this? Because I will be with you. Let's pray.